Tom, I need to tell you something. I am pregnant. Words that would bring untold joy to some couples. But when you are single, and both are still finding your way in life, believe me, it is not the same at all. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So let's go back in time a little. As it turned out, not very far. Just a few weeks or so. Dawn and I had been friends since elementary school, where we were in the same class, and I was only a month older than her. We were friends. Our parents were friends, and for that matter, even our grandparents were friends. It was only natural that we ended up dating together, and she was my only girl, and I was her only guy. It was natural. It was meant to be. Seems like the natural order of things. Now, we both came from fairly religious families, where virtue was still taken seriously, and Dawn made it very clear that I had no intention of going beyond first base until we were both at least of legal age. I didn't argue, and at that time, given my upbringing, I wasn't even offended by it. Then I became an adult, and a month later, Dawn. They were a very nervous couple who began experimenting with things that most couples our age were probably all already familiar with. We loved it. Well, of course we both loved it. And in fact, it was bloody wonderful. And within a week, we made the big decision to go all the way. It actually wasn't very good, but I guess that's often the case. And by the time I got the hang of the birth control I'd just bought that day. Everything else was a bit of a blur anyway, at least realizing that I was no longer a virgin. I continued to pursue the love of my life and began training to be a bricklayer at a local construction firm. I liked it from the very beginning. Get your darn criminals in order, you useless jerk, the foreman shouted at me, but by his smile I knew that I was doing well. I was straight, so I just grinned back, lowered my head, and carried on. Tom, are you going to the dance today? It was Fred, one of the skilled brickmakers, five or six years older than me. The guy who helped me out several times when I was lost, and what I was doing and sort of adopted me on the site. Yes, I guess, Fred, I replied a little cheekily. I think Don really wants to go. I'll take it if you don't want to go, he joked to me. She's so cute. This is your Zaria. What he said was of course true, as Don was about five foot three inches tall, with beautiful brown hair that went down to her shoulders. She had what could be called a neat figure, beautiful and curvy, but not too curvy, and a thin waist that I could almost wrap both hands around. Although, to be honest, I probably never really understood at that stage what a lovely woman Don was growing into. Accordingly, we showed up to the dance later that evening, me and my best jeans and all, and Don in a short summer dress that just did everything for her figure and shapely legs. She was beautiful and radiant, and judging by the looks from the other guys, I obviously wasn't the only one who thought so. I think even then I knew I would have to be on my toes. And of course, a steady stream of fans kept coming to ask her to dance. I didn't mind. Well, you know what it's like when you're young and inexperienced. In a few years, I might have enjoyed the attention she received. I might have been more tolerant of the way they kept her around, maybe even taking some pleasure in how outrageously some of them flirted with her. I probably wouldn't have even minded the fact that Don was openly flirting back, but being an inexperienced person, so insecure when there was this crowd around who were mostly a little older than us, I just didn't handle it well. I didn't know how to do this. Jealousy is a terrible thing to suffer from, and I suffered greatly. How about you dance with me? I asked Don when I'd had enough. The last six times you danced with those guys. This must be my time. Not this one, Tom. She shot back at me, hardly bothering to look me in the eyes. I promised Alf the next one would be slow, and he'd be upset if I let him down. Oh my gosh. Of course this happens all the time, but I didn't know it. The young girl's head was turned by the flattery and attention of older and more experienced men, and they were fascinated by the youthful beauty of a pretty girl who came out to have fun. I watched as Alf laid my girlfriend down on the floor. I watched as he held her close, too close. I watched as his left hand slid carefully down her back, almost cupping her buttocks, and I watched as he leaned down and quickly kissed her neck. But I didn't look any more like a fool. I went out onto the dance floor and started taking them apart. Get your hands off my girlfriend, I shouted at him. Get mad, little runt, Alf shouted at me, pushing me away as I tried to get my girl back. 
the situation deteriorated very quickly. As usually happens when there are young people, strong drinks, and an argument over a girl. Within moments, we were both wrestling together, trying to throw punches and wrestle each other on the floor. He may have been older than me, but at least I persevered. Dawn started screaming, and then others joined in, and before I knew it, I found myself in the middle of the ruckus I had started. Then the bouncers arrived. Well, they do, don't they? They soon grabbed me by the collar, and I suspect were about to search me when Fred, my senior colleague at work, intercepted me. Luckily, he seemed to know the bouncers and convinced them that I had been provoked into a fight. Okay, so I didn't get processed, but I still got kicked out of the place. And what do you no doubt think about Don? Oh, really? I was outside and my girlfriend was still there with all these horny guys, and I was convinced that one of them would get to her. I was furious, screwing furious. I was angry at Dawn for this behavior, unable to realize that she was just a young girl enjoying attention. Oh, the distractions of youth. Okay, a little more than just attention. But if I had just kept my cool, then, well, who knows? Perhaps my life could have turned out differently. The problem was that I was all for storming back in and killing a lot of them. It's stupid. Really, really stupid because I would have been stabbed to death. But such is the arrogance of youth. Wait, Tom. Fred tried to reassure me, stopping me from returning. I guess the fact that he did it so easily was some reflection of me realizing how stupid it would be. You can't go back there, Tom. Accept it. You just can't. I will kill that jerk alpha, I said through my anger. Yes, of course, Tom, Fred advised me. Perhaps you will, but not tonight, and not in the state you are in. I'm not at all sure that I really saw the wisdom in his words, but nevertheless, as he continued to hold me, I eventually calmed down. What about Dawn? I finally asked my friend. She's still out there somewhere, and God knows what she's up to. Dawn is a sensible girl, Tom, Fred tried to reassure me. She won't do anything stupid, I promise you. So why didn't she come see how I was doing? I demanded, almost to the point of tears. Probably scared, Fred replied. You acted out of order, mate, and she's probably scared to come out. The two of us calmed down, and finally Fred let me go, glad that I wouldn't do anything stupid. Listen, Tom, he told me in a serious tone. You stay here and behave yourself, and I'll come back and get Dawn. I mumbled something, but Fred made me promise to stay put and not try to follow him back into the building. I then had to wait ten agonizing minutes while Fred went to find my friend. I felt terrible. I hated everyone, and really wished we hadn't gone out that evening. But of course we did it. And as much as I wanted to, I couldn't turn back time. It was probably the worst ten minutes of my life up to that point. And if Fred hadn't come back, then I'm sure I would have rushed back there. She's crying in the toilet, Fred told me sadly. She's surrounded by cutesy women who all think you're a stupid moron. But at least if any of these guys tried to attack her now, the other women would dismember them. It was quite obvious that Dawn would not be coming out any time soon, and Fred and I stood and chatted while my irritation gradually subsided. He finally convinced me that the best thing I could do was get angry at home and promise me that he would personally make sure Dawn wouldn't be bothered again, and that he would make sure she got home safely. I didn't like the idea, of course, but Fred came back to the house and confirmed that Dawn was calming down and would call me the next morning. Yes, you are right, of course. A terrible end to a bloody, terrible evening. Halfway home, I threw the package of condoms I'd taken with me into a ditch. A stupid action, but I really hoped I'd need them that night. After the mess we'd had ten days ago. And my reckless action kind of summed up my evening. Darn it. She didn't call me the next morning. Down, that is. I decided she didn't care. If she shouldn't have bothered to call me, then I won't run after her. There are plenty of fish in the sea, and I wasn't a bad guy. No, let her go to heck. She might get lost. I lasted the whole day. I don't even know how I managed it, but I stuck it out. And when I finally called her, I regretted it. You stupid idiot. She started scolding me to embarrass me like that in front of everyone. Expect me to act like you own me? What are you imagining? The conversation continued like this, with her screaming accusations at me and me occasionally interjecting a yes or a well, or even a sorry honey. She didn't even agree to see me right away. 
suggests that we should give ourselves time to cool down completely against my will. I agreed to her idea that we should wait a week before seeing each other again. She promised to call me, but of course, a week passed, and I heard nothing. Nine days later, I called Dawn. Hey Tom, what do you want? Not a very encouraging answer, is it? And the rest of our rather short conversation did not add optimism either. Basically, they put me on pause for another week. I know I should have sent her one or something, but I love this girl. Always have, and couldn't imagine life without her, and was too inexperienced in life to know what else to do. I was just dying inside myself. After the second week, she relented and agreed to go out with me. But our date wasn't the best we've ever had. There was a distance between us that wasn't there before, and all I could do was blame myself. This went on for another week or so, and eventually she became warmer to me again. Although any form of sexual interaction seemed to be completely ruled out, almost the only bright moment of this sad period was when she assured me that she had not gone off with Alf or any of his friends that terrible evening, and that Fred had indeed taken her home soon after. As promised. Then I heard those words. You know the ones I already talked about, Tom. I have something to tell you. I'm pregnant. Yes. I got her pregnant, and both of us not yet experienced. We're going to become parents. Apparently, we were right to worry about the condom slipping off at the end of our only attempt at making love. Then it started. What a commotion. Parents. That is, since we both still lived at home. They took over all of our decisions. We will get married as soon as possible. We would live with her parents who had more space than us. No choice. Was I upset? Disappointed? Disappointed? Not at all. Not really. Down soon became my down again. And we kiss it. And who get like before our parents did everything they could to keep us from getting a chance to have love again before the wedding. We didn't have the opportunity to have love again. But two determined people will always find a way. It just seemed easier than our previous attempts, and we soon seemed to get the hang of it. The wedding had taken place, a small event, and Dawn looked so beautiful. But fortunately, there was no sign of the baby yet. However, over the next weeks and months, she seemed to grow and grow until she finally gave birth to our baby. Marge is to us our beautiful, perfect little daughter. From the ashes of what may have seemed like a disaster. Our marriage grew exponentially. I completed my apprenticeship as a bricklayer and that same year won an industry award for being the best qualified apprentice in our region. I soon started making some serious money, and then when I joined a piecework team, my earnings seemed to skyrocket. I was fast, clean, and accurate, easily clearing a thousand bricks a day. And as a left-hander, I was in great demand among the other members of my team. Sorry, but you need to understand bricklaying techniques to understand why this was an advantage for me, and I don't have time to explain. We were soon able to move out of Dawn's parents' house and rent our own place managing to save a little each week so that we could one day buy our own home. Marge grew up to be a beautiful baby and the center of our lives together, and both sets of parents have long since forgiven us both for our erroneous behavior. It really seemed like life couldn't get much better. And by the way, take into account our love life, Dawn never ceased to amaze me with her resourcefulness and never refuse me anything. I loved my wife and daughter. I was proud of my family and proud of what we both achieved. Well, as they say, pride comes before a fall. Fred always remained friendly to me and Dawn, and I suppose in some ways I was still grateful to him for helping me when I needed it. He had several different girlfriends, and we often met as two couples. However, he never agreed with anyone and spent quite a lot of time in our new home. It worked for us and he soon became our daughter's Uncle Fred, even looking out for us at times when we needed someone at short notice. Every week, Fred and I would go to the pub and meet up with our mates, and quite often when we'd go back to my house and have a couple more drinks. He'd end up staying the night, his ability to drive home a little suspect. He was a good friend. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I came home early and found Fred and my wife in bed or anything like that. No, that was not true at all. Perhaps it would be better if it were that simple. Have you noticed the way Fred is looking at me? Don't ask me. One morning, right after Fred had left for work, having spent the night at our house as usual the night before. Of course I have, Don, I replied, smirking at her. 
You know darn well he thinks you're crazy. Don laughed. I remember it was such a wonderful sound when she laughed. So you don't. You're jealous, aren't you, darling? I wasn't jealous, and told her so. I've matured a lot since I lost my temper, and made a scene that night. Now, I was more of a man, more confident in myself. No longer experiencing that critical lack of confidence. I knew men were looking at my wife. I knew what they were thinking, and I knew she liked it. Darn, I loved it too. What man wouldn't like to know that other guys are jealous of you when you have such a sweet young wife? I absolutely loved it. I'm glad you're not jealous, darling, she continued, because last night when I went to the bathroom, I thought he was going to bed, and he found me in my bra and underwear. My eyes widened at this revelation, and maybe that wasn't the only part of me I had never thought about my reaction to another guy seeing my wife half bare, and I was surprised by how much it turned me on. God, how things have changed in just five years. What happened? What did you do? I demanded, trying not to sound too interested, still unsure of the feelings it brought up. Just said oops or something like that, and walked back out of the bathroom. I don't think you exposed your chest to him, did you? I asked, smiling widely. Maybe I did it a little, dear, she replied, smiling back at me. Wow. Being married for almost five years and never knowing that my wife could be such a seductress. Dawn slowly pulled the robe off her shoulders and let it slide seductively to the floor. She had only her bra and underwear underneath. Very sexy, very small. These aren't the underwear you wore last night, Dawn, I pointed out to her. No. She thought for a moment before continuing. But if you want, I can wear them next time. Oh my god. She looks so darn amazing and sexy. My throat is dry. What about this, dear? Don asked me further, and reached behind her to unclamp, her bra slipping the straps over her shoulders. She let a small piece of nothing fall. Well, Fred, my wife egged me on, leaning toward me and exposing her bare chest. Would you like to kiss my chest? I'm sure Tom wouldn't mind it too much. Who, Fred? My wife continued. It's so wonderful, sassy girl. Okay, I admit I was late for work that morning, but that was a rare occurrence for me. No one actually asked me why I was late or if they did. What would I say? That I had to wait while we pretended my friend Fred was having love with my wife. I couldn't stop thinking about it all day, and when I got home that evening, I felt so horny that I grabbed Don as soon as I walked in. Luckily, she apparently felt the same way. Dinner was late that night, it was also a little overcooked. We sat around the table after dinner, finishing off the last of our wine, both probably wondering who would be the first to bring up the subject. Don beat me to it. You seem to like the idea of me showing off my body to Fred this morning, Tom. I nodded because there was no point in denying. Not as far as you went with me this morning, darling. I told her it was a good fantasy, but not in reality. Don pouted, feigning disappointment, then laughed deliciously. To what extent can I then? She asked God. She was serious. I know my wife. Well, at least I thought so. And despite her childish giggles, she was serious. To what extent did I really want to take it? Did I really want to start? Where the heck could this lead? Well, Tom, she repeated. To what extent can I then? A sip? Oh my God. How out of place I was. My mind and the other part of my body were definitely in conflict and she knew it. Maybe next time he comes with you, you could wear something sexy, was all I could manage to say. How sexy? Well, I don't know, honey. I was a little lost. Maybe a little revealing. How? Frank. God, she didn't let me back down, didn't she? Well, don't. I don't know. I continued, a little embarrassed by it all, but excited nonetheless. Maybe a short skirt and a revealing top. Okay, Down replied a little harshly for my liking. Very short skirt and strapless top. You can't wear a bra with that. What about underwear? Of course you have to wear underwear, I quickly replied, deciding that this was already beyond my boundaries. I'm not going to let you flash your bare butt in front of him. Okay, that's settled. Don finished and abruptly changed the subject. I sat there trying to gather my thoughts, only listening to half of what she was now talking about and wondering what I had just gotten myself into. Darn. I kind of got set up. Well, this could be fun anyway. 
I was a little afraid of the consequences. How will this affect us? How will this change our relationship? But at the same time, part of me was excited, even intrigued by this new, unpredictable side of my wife. Over the next few days, I thought about it constantly, trying to imagine how this could all unfold. Don and I had never discussed these things before, and this was new territory for both of us. When the day arrived for Fred to come to us, my wife got ready. She chose the shortest skirt I'd ever seen her wear, and a top that barely covered what she needed. She looked incredibly sexy, and I couldn't look away. Are you sure this is normal, Tom? She asked, noticing my frightened look. Yes, yes. This, this is just new to me, I managed to say with difficulty. Deep down, I felt that we were crossing some kind of border, but it was too late to change anything. When Fred arrived, I could see his surprise and delight when he saw Dawn. She played the role perfectly, flirting with him, but not crossing the line we discussed. But even this innocent game was enough to raise the tension in the room. The evening passed without much incident, but the air was thick with unspoken promises and possibilities. After Fred left, Don and I talked about what happened. It was an honest and open conversation, and to my surprise, we both felt pretty comfortable with how things went. It was weird, Don admitted, but also exciting. I agreed it was something new and different from anything we had tried before. I don't know where it will take us, but I knew we would explore it together, mutually respecting each other's boundaries. From then on, we began to openly discuss our fantasies and desires, which strengthened our relationship and trust. This experience, although it started as a challenge, turned into an opportunity for growth and understanding between us. This story is a reminder that what matters in a relationship is communication, trust, and a willingness to explore new things together, even if it seems a little scary or unusual. In the end, it is these experiences that are often the most memorable and valuable. The week flew by in a blur, and before I knew it, the evening of our pub visit had arrived. Dawn was in an enthusiastic mood, not hiding her anticipation of the little performance. I wasn't so sure, but I knew well that after a few glasses of beer, I would be happy to get into the game and without a doubt take advantage of the moment. We discussed it a little more over the course of the week, and I set some rules. We agreed that she could wear whatever she wanted as long as it didn't expose her chest, and kept her underwear covered. She agreed too easily. I didn't trust her. I'm not sure if that bothered me or not. And in the back of my mind, I was hoping that maybe she would cross the line after all. We talked about whether I should somehow prepare Fred, but I couldn't think of a way without giving away the game. Don said she'd take care of it, so I left it to her, having enough to think about as it was. We kissed passionately as I left to go to the pub, suddenly panicking at the thought that Fred wouldn't come. Well, that would help me out, wouldn't it? But is this what I really wanted? Of course he was there, and we spent a fun evening playing darts and pool with our other friends. By the time I'd had a few beers, I thought about inviting them all back and giving them a little visual show. But no reason took over my throat was dry despite the beer. As we walked slowly back to our house, my heart pounding. I don't know if Fred sensed my mood, but he seemed preoccupied with his own thoughts, and we barely spoke the entire way home. When the key went into the front door lock, my emotions were a mess. I wanted to continue this, but at the same time, I didn't want to. I was on the verge of panic like an automaton. I opened the door and let Fred inside. I didn't even know what she would wear as she refused to tell me. I just knew in my heart that it probably wouldn't be much. As planned, I made sure that Fred entered the living room before me so that he would see Dawn first. We just thought it would be better this way. I can tell you that my heart was in my throat, and by then, I was desperate to see what was in store for us. Darn it. Dawn is well looked on without even entering the room. Fred's reaction gave me a good idea. Whatever it was, it clearly had an effect. Crap. I just didn't know Dawn had such a short skirt, such high heels, or such an insignificant top about. She exclaimed, covering her mouth with her hand, pretending to be surprised. What are you doing at home so early? It's normal time, Don. Fred managed to get out before I could. If anything, I was even more stunned than he was. But... 
but she faltered, playing her part so well. I was just trying on these old things for fun before giving them to the charity shop. I haven't worn them in a long time. I didn't realize it was so late. Well, that at least explained where these things came from. Although she had definitely grown up over the years, didn't really explain the sexy high heels. But who cared? Look, I better change into something more decent now that you two are back. This was my signal. It's okay, honey. You look great. Looks darn good, Fred added, and Dawn smiled, trying to hide her embarrassment. Are you guys sure? she asked us. Sure, we answered in unison. Well, everything has been going well so far. We sat down, and Dawn went to the kitchen to get some drinks. Darn, Tom, Fred remarked when he was finally able to come to his senses. Your Dawn looks amazing. I've never seen her so sexy. I told him to enjoy the moment, as it would probably never happen again, and waited for my wife to return. She handed us our drinks and sat down across from us. Yes, it was confirmed. She did put on her underwear as agreed. Blue with a beautiful piece of lace on the front. I knew them well, but in a moment, Fred would be able to describe them almost as well as I could, as her already minuscule skirt rode even higher on her hips. Hey, Don, I told her. You're showing too much, darling. Sitting there across from us, a few beers inside me. And it's true that I really didn't care much, but I felt like I had to say something. Well, then stop looking at my underwear, you pair of perverts. She giggled at us. She liked it. It's hard not to look when you show them off like that. Fred joined in. He seemed to enjoy it too. I bet I can get you two to stop looking at my underwear. Don continued, giggling and laughing at our obvious reaction. I bet you don't, Fred replied. How many? She challenged cheekily. Two pennies, I joked back. Only two pennies? Okay, sixpence. I upped the ante, perhaps thinking back on it. I shouldn't have done that without another word. Dawn grabbed the bottom of her top and in one swift movement lifted it straight above her head and threw it into the corner. Her ample bare chest bounced up and down at the sudden movement, needing a few moments to calm down. Now who's looking at my underwear? Stupid question. She leaned back in her chair, put her hands behind her head, and stuck out her too wonderful chest like a Playboy model. I was shocked. No, really shocked. Never in my life did I expect my Don to do something so bold. Not in front of Fred, not in front of anyone, but she proved her point. Neither of us looked at her underwear again. I took my eyes off Don for a moment and looked at my friend Fred. His tongue hung out and his eyes bulged. I probably looked exactly the same. Well, how do you like it? It was Don who asked. But what could she say? Neither of us said anything. Any comments, guys? was her next confident statement. Who is this woman? Is this really my dear wife? Take a closer look at what you think. She continued. Then she stood up, took a few steps towards us, and sank down between the two of us. It was too much. No. Let's go. She's gone too far. Far. I didn't agree to her showing off her bare chest, and especially not to flaunting them right under poor Fred's nose. Don... What the heck are you doing? It should have been a scream, but it turned out to be more of a groan. Oh, Fred doesn't care, does he, Fred? Another stupid question. But I screwing care, Don, I really care. Then you don't deserve a kiss. She said at me, and dismissively leaning towards Fred, wrapped her arms around him, and began to kiss him. I watch it in some sort of agony as they exchange tongues, not knowing what to do or how to react to this unexpected turn of events. It may sound stupid, but I felt almost paralyzed and strangely excited by the scene in front of me. It wasn't until Fred's hand slid up and cupped her breast that I came out of my daze. Hey, stop it, you two! I called out to them, trying to pull Fred's hand away. Okay, honey, now it's your turn. With that, I found myself consumed by my horny wife. As she dropped, Fred wrapped her arms around me and pressed her lips tightly against mine, forcing her tongue down my throat. She climbed onto my lap and hugged me like one possessed. I've never seen her in this state before. No, don't stop. This is too much. But to no avail. Don had dry love with me. Only then did I understand what Fred was doing. Crap. With a shock that surpassed even the ones before. I gaped as I saw him pull my wife's underwear down her thighs 
her pathetic skirt long gathered around her waist. With a little effort, he lifted her up a little, and with a flourish, he pulled them down her legs and removed them completely. No, absolutely not. This shouldn't have happened. I agreed to play an innocent little tease with Fred, but my darn wife turned it into something horrible. Heck, except for her skirt gathered around her waist. She lay completely bare between us. Darn it. Stop it. Fred! I screamed at my so-called best friend as I saw him start fondling my wife. Stop! Stop now! I jumped up and pulled my wife away from my friend. Feeling nauseous, Don ended up slumped on the floor while I stood over Fred, trying to calm my anger, not knowing what the heck to do next. Sorry, guy, he shouted at me, looking at my angry face. Sorry, Tom, I just got carried away. I stood over him, trying to calm my anger, not knowing what to do next. It's not Fred's fault. Don babbled at my feet. Don't do anything stupid, Tom. It's all my fault. I got carried away. I got carried away. I got carried away. What the heck were you thinking about, you stupid jerk? I had never scolded Don in my life, and despite what she did, I immediately regretted it, somehow managing to come down to earth and stop myself from doing something that I would regret later. No harm? Well, no real harm. Who the heck am I kidding? Don stood up, and we all stood there looking at each other warily. My heart pounding and my head spinning. Lower your skirt. You're an easy girl. I snapped at Dawn, who was still bare except for her skirt, now tightly bunched around her waist. She grabbed her skirt and began to unbutton it. I told you to put it down, you cow. Don't take it off, I screamed at the top of my lungs. I'll have to take it off to straighten it out. She sobbed back at me. How could you, Dawn? I asked her. How could you do this to us? Okay. To heck with you, Tom. She shouted back, ripped off her skirt, and stood there completely bare except for her high heels. I'm sorry. I really am. But, but, oh, I don't know. She burst into tears, turned on her heel, and rushed to the door. Then we heard her heels clicking on wood as she hurried up the stairs to our bedroom. Darn, Tom, I heard Fred say to me. Sorry, kid. It got out of hand. It probably shouldn't have happened like that. What do you mean shouldn't have happened? I looked back at him. Nothing, Tom. Nothing, he answered, muffledly. Maybe I should go. Maybe it's worth it, Fred, I told him. He didn't start it, but he was the one who groped my wife. But in the state you are in, you'll get arrested for drunk driving. I kind of hated this guy, but he was my best friend. What was I supposed to say? He nodded, relieved that I wasn't going to kick him out, planning to return to the pub in the morning to pick up his car as he usually did. Maybe you should go and talk to her, Fred suggested. I'll stay here for a little while if you don't mind. I think I need another drink after all this. Agreeing with him, I carefully walked up the stairs to our bedroom, not sure what to expect and having no idea how I could handle Don's incredible behavior. I opened the door and saw my wife sitting on the edge of the bed, tears running down her face, still bare, although by then she had already taken off her shoes. My heart responded to her. I loved her more than life itself, and no matter what she did, and no matter why it was. I knew we could get through it. Everything will be fine. Our love was strong enough. But at that moment, I didn't even know what to say. So honey, that was all I could say. Dawn's head shot up when she realized I had entered the room, and she began to cry. Oh, I'm so sorry, darling. I'm just so sorry. It's okay, honey. Everything will be okay. I tried to reassure her you were wrong, but we will overcome this. It's not okay, Tom. I love you, darling, but it's not okay at all. You just don't understand. Well, it's true. I was completely lost, and all that came to my mind was to go up to her and put my arm around her shoulders to calm her down. Where's Fred? Don suddenly asked, looking at me through her tears. Who the heck cares where Fred is? This is between us, isn't it? I told her he's still downstairs. Having another drink to calm down nerves? I didn't say, but at that moment, perhaps I needed this drink more than he did. I better go and talk to him. Tom Down whispered to me. I think I need to talk to him about tonight. No need, Don. You can talk to him in the morning. I'm sure he'll understand. No, no, Tom, she mumbled. You don't understand. I need to talk to him now. With these words, she stood up and headed towards the door. Did she need to talk to him? What about me? 
Darn it, Don, I screamed at her. At least get dressed. She turned to me, apologized as if in a dream, and put on a robe. Listen, Don, you really don't need to see him tonight, I said to her, trying to grab her hand, but she pulled away, shaking her head. I need it, Tom. I need to deal with this now. I let her go. I don't know why, but I did it. Perhaps I shouldn't have, but such was my confusion that my head was full of confusion. I thought about following her, but I sank onto the bed, mentally exhausted. After a few minutes, I started wondering where the heck she was. Darn. Fred's problems. What about mine? When will she come back to discuss everything with me? Rising with difficulty from the bed, I left the room and walked along the corridor, smiled, seeing one of the few smiles of the night when I passed it. The room of my beloved daughter. Thank God she didn't wake up to take part in what was happening. Halfway up the stairs I stopped, shocked by the sight in front of me. Oh my good God, no. Dawn was sitting on the couch, cuddled up to Fred, her robe pulled down to her waist. She buried her head in his chest and cried. What have we done, Fred? She sobbed. I still love Tom. You know I do. But we can't go back now, Fred. It's too late. It's okay, Don, he replied. Maybe it was just a stupid idea. Maybe Tom will understand anyway, to understand that. I demanded loudly as I entered the room. What the heck is going on here? They both looked at me sadly. Then Don started sobbing loudly again. What's going on here? I demanded again, raising my voice. At least Dawn had the decency to drape her robe over her shoulders. Dawn still loves you, Tom, Fred informed me. No matter what happens, she still loves you. Always has. While my stomach was doing somersaults, I stood there trying to understand the meaning of his words. I really love you, Tom, Dawn sobbed. I really do. But somehow, I also have feelings for Fred with these words. My previously comfortable outlook collapsed. My wife and my best friend. Impossible. It couldn't be. But it was. Darn it. It happened. And nothing will ever be the same. Silence reigned as both of them gave me time for the information to properly sink in. What the heck happened tonight? I croaked. Sorry, Tom. Fred interjected. We were trying to get you to accept the idea of sharing Don with me. We thought maybe you'd agree. And then Don and I could be open about our feelings. Sorry, Tom. A darn stupid idea. Really? Oh, I'm so sorry, darling. Don joined in. It was my idea. My stupid thought. I can't imagine how I thought you would agree. So you were trying to trick me? I said sadly. Why did you need this? Why couldn't you just tell me? Ask me? Would you understand, Tom? My wife asked. No, no, I wouldn't understand. I was forced to admit. I always imagined that if I ever found myself in this situation... I would get angry and try to hit someone. In my youth, I was somewhat short-tempered, so this would not be new. But I didn't do it. It was as if I had no feelings left inside at all. Only a huge emptiness where my heart used to be. All I could do was stand there watching them both, waiting for one of them to make the next move. So say something. Darn it. Do you want me to climb into bed with you, darling? Don asked nervously. Well, did I want to? Yes, I wanted to. I wanted my wife back. I wanted to hold her close to me. I wanted to make love to her. I needed to make her mine again. I wanted it all to go away. But that won't happen, will it? No. Not tonight, honey. I told her. I don't think I can. What about me, Tom? Fred asked quietly. Do you want me to leave? Do you want to be left alone to discuss this with Don? What's the point of this? What else is there to talk about? My marriage is over. Over? They just haven't gotten around to it yet. They imagined in their own little world that everything could be worked out. Do what you want, Fred, I answered firmly. Do what you want with her. But I'll be sleeping in our, excuse me, my bedroom tonight so you can do whatever you want. As I turned to walk sadly back to our, excuse me, my bedroom, I heard Don scream, Tom, please, please, please try to understand. Half an hour later, unable to sleep, I heard the door to the guest room close. At that moment, I neither knew nor cared whether they went to bed together or not. I lay awake for several hours, trying to understand my present and future. Suddenly, I thought of my beautiful daughter, fast asleep in the next room, unaware of how her world was about to collapse. 
I wanted to cry, but the tears wouldn't come. I was too exhausted. What the heck will happen in the morning? I had a stupid idea. The stupidest idea in the world. But who cared? I got up quietly, got dressed, and packed a few things in my bag for the night. I then went to my beautiful daughter's room and gently picked her up from her crib. I grabbed a few more things for her not knowing what, and carefully left the room with her in my arms. I walked past the door where those two were, the only sound being the quiet cry of my wife. At least they weren't making love from the house and to my car. Carefully started it and drove slowly. I had no idea where I was going. There were no hotels open nearby at that time of night, and I certainly couldn't wake up my parents or friends. But this was not the essence of my action, not my goal at all. I knew my marriage to Dawn was probably over. If she had had a casual affair, or gone astray at a party or something like that, then who knows? I might just might forgive and forget. But she loved him. She told me she loved him. What does this even mean? How could she? How long did it last? No, that was the end. Even though I knew I still loved Down, I just wasn't ready to share her with someone. But I wanted my daughter. And even though I knew I couldn't just run away with her, I wanted Down to suffer. I wanted her to wake up in the morning and find that I had disappeared during the night. This will definitely excite her, but when she finds out that I took Marge with me, then she will go crazy cruel. But why not? Like I said, I just wanted her to get hurt, to find out how it is. She deserved it. I drove just a few miles up the road and pulled over to the side of the road where I parked. After checking that the baby was cozy and warm for the night in the back seat, I settled in to wait for the morning. I didn't expect to fall asleep, but I did. I woke up with larks and spent the next half hour staring across the back seat at my sleeping daughter, wondering what would happen to us. How should I know? As I expected, my cell phone started ringing around seven in the morning. They weren't that common in those days, and I only had it recently for me. Even the bell sounded panicked, and I just let it ring. I decided to wait until the baby woke up before answering Dawn for the next hour or more. The phone kept ringing, and I kept turning it off. Finally, Marge began to show signs of waking up, and the next time the phone rang, I answered it. Hello, Dawn, I replied. Where the heck are you, Tom? She shouted into the phone. Where's Marge? What did you do with her? I smiled. There was panic in her voice. She's okay, Dawn, I replied. She is with me by then. Dawn was already crying, begging me to bring her back. Please, please, Tom, bring Marge back home. Please don't do anything stupid. What do you think I could do that stupid, Marge? I demanded. Would you do something stupid at this? Dawn simply dissolved into tears, sobbing into the phone. Although I could not make out what she was saying, I listened. Perhaps I achieved my goal. Tom, came, Fred's voice apparently picking up the phone from my wife. Stop being a fool, buddy. Just bring the baby home, please. Of course, Fred, I replied. I just took her for a little walk and we're not far. I wasn't going to let them know what I actually did or why. Thank you, Tom, he replied. Come back. We really need to talk. Where are we? Dad asked my sleepy daughter from the back seat. We were just going for a little walk, honey, I told her. Where is Mom? she asked. She's with Uncle Fred. I told her honestly. Oh, okay. Oh, the innocence of childhood. Twenty minutes later, I pulled up to our house, and Dawn ran out to meet me. She took Marge from me, and was about to say something, but changed her mind, took two steps back towards the house, and then turned around. I love you, Tom. I'm so sorry for trying to trick you last night, and I'm so sorry about Fred. Please believe that I love you no matter what. I never stopped loving you. I believed her. I knew she loved me, but I couldn't understand or accept her relationship with Fred. I thought about this as I sat waiting for Marge to wake up, and I more or less organized my thoughts. I didn't want to lose my daughter no matter what happened. I also didn't want to lose Dawn. She was my girlfriend for almost half of my life. I'll take a stand. If Dawn is ready to send Fred to heck, then I will be ready to try to make things right. It won't be easy, but I will keep my family together. And I can't believe Dan would choose Fred over his real family. What will I do with Fred? I had no idea. And I didn't have the energy to worry about him. 
With some confidence, feeling like I had the upper hand a little, I walked into the house, nodding to Fred when I saw him. I didn't have anything I wanted to say to him at that moment, and I certainly wasn't going to engage in idle conversation with him. This was between me and Dawn, although I didn't care if he listened. Dawn fed our daughter breakfast and got her ready for school, while Fred went back to the pub and picked up his car. Without further ado, it was agreed by everyone that we would wait until Marge left. Dawn's friend came to pick up our daughter since it was her turn to do so, and with Fred returning, we all sat down, facing each other. Dawn was very careful. I noticed not to give preference to either of us when choosing where to sit down began. I can't tell you, honey, how sorry I am about last night. I don't know what we were thinking, but I really love you very much and always have. Is there a way to make this work? How long did it last? I asked. They looked at each other as if waiting for confirmation before Dawn responded. Long time, Tom. Sorry, but quite a long time. How many? I repeated my question. A few years was the only answer I received. Darn, it took so long. We've been living a lie all this time. I saw no point in messing around anymore, and laid out my conditions that as Marge's father, I had rights to her and would never give her up. If Dawn isn't willing to send Fred packing, then I'll divorce her and ask for custody of Marge. It's not that simple, Tom, Fred intervened. I'd appreciate it if you'd keep your nose out of our business, Fred, I growled at him. This is between my wife and I, and we are discussing my daughter and our future together. You better tell him or I'll have to, Fred told Don with a sigh. I can't, she muttered. You must. He encouraged her. Or I will. Tell me that, I asked. I needed to know what they were talking about. Tom, Don began, but then hesitated before continuing. She looked as if she had aged ten years since last night. Tom, it's not that simple. You're not Marge's father. Fred is. Oh, God. No. I think I've collapsed. I know I was throwing up on the floor. A few hours later, I came to my senses. But I was able to continue our conversation only late in the evening. Dawn explained that on the night five years ago, when I got kicked out of the club, Fred actually drove her home. But when she started crying halfway home, he stopped to console her. She got really angry with me, and one thing led to another. He comforted her, held her, and that, of course, led to a kiss. And before they knew it, they were passionately hugging each other. On that fateful night, when he was kicked out of the club and Fred was driving me home. We couldn't contain our emotions. Fred, being more experienced with relationships, seduced me, and I, young and naive, gladly gave in to his advances. For compared to the inept Tom, Fred seemed like an amazing lover to me. Soon after I missed my period when my mom found out I was pregnant, she assumed Tom was the father, since we had been intimate. But deep down, I suspected the child could be friends. However, I didn't dare tell my parents about that fling. It would have disgraced the family, and our parents had already decided to marry Tom and me off as soon as possible. I was so young and scared, so I simply went along with their decision, even though I truly only loved Tom. As for Fred... I only felt physical attraction years later, mustering all my courage. I opened Tom's eyes to that story. He was shaken, engulfed in anger over my infidelity. But deep down, he understood my youthful fears and dependence on our parents back then. Now Tom even doubted whether Marge was really his daughter. Dawn smiled at me as if I were a child myself. Tom, be reasonable. You were inside me once for a few seconds, barely penetrated me and wore a condom. Fred had love with me ten, twenty times a week for two or three weeks. Never use protection. Darn fool. This is not exactly what I wanted to hear. Besides, Fred added, Marge is the spitting image of my mother. What about the blood test? I was still hanging on for dear life. They both shook their heads. They had foreseen this possibility a long time ago. Oh, crap. I didn't know anything about it until it was announced that you were getting married. Fred continued the story. I just assumed you were having love with Dawn this whole time. She couldn't seem to get enough at that time. Fred, Dawn interrupted. It's already difficult for Tom. Don't rub it in. Sorry, Tom, he continued. I didn't mean to disparage your abilities, but like I said at the time, I was happy to stay away. 
I had fun and kind of dodged a bullet. And then I took your bullet. I sighed miserably. So when did you two make up again? I asked. I was already in enough pain, and I felt it was time for me to end it. They both looked at each other for a long time, making it clear that what I was about to hear was not going to be good. Dawn put her head in her hands, began to sob again, and motioned for Fred to continue. Oh my gosh, Tom, I hate to tell you this, he finally spat. Sorry, mate, I feel terrible about this. But when Dawn was away on her hen night, the night before your wedding, I ran into them all at the town pub and... Well, well, we went to my car. He simply shrugged, unable to tell me the rest. This was supposed to be the last goodbye love. Dawn interjected between sobs. By this time, you and I had already made love several times, and you felt better. But you weren't like Fred. I just needed him one more time before I settled down with you. Tom, who's rubbing this into Dawn? Fred added. Sorry, Tom, but that's how it happened. You're doing much better here. Much better. Almost as good as Fred. But at that time, thank you for the vote of confidence was all I could manage. That's when Dawn told me the baby was mine. Fred continued, As soon as Marge was born, I got to see her, and as soon as I held her in my arms, I knew I had to be a part of her life and became Uncle Fred and my wife's constant lover. I finished for him. They both looked at me, sadly, not having to confirm my words. What are you going to do, Tom? asked my wife. Can you forgive me? Forgive us both. We can work this out between us somehow. Tom, I still love you dearly, but now I have feelings for Tom. And, well, he's Marge's real father. Of course. There was no way out. I was too hurt and humiliated to even try. Dawn didn't dare ask me to sleep with her that night, and I didn't want to ask. She naturally went to bed with Fred, who seemed to have established himself at her permanent and main place of residence. I still loved Marge, and even Dawn for that matter. But too much had happened after all. But too much happened. Too much water has flown under the bridge. I took Marge for one last walk to the local park the next morning, and it broke my heart. She was so happy and playful, and I knew it would be the last time I would play the role of her father. I told her that I was going to be away for a while, but promised that I would come back and play a big role in her life in the future. But of course, she didn't understand what I was talking about. She just laughed and pressed herself against me, asking me to rock her again. I took her back to her mother and new father, told them I forgive them both, and left. I never returned to work and assumed Fred would tell them I wasn't coming back. I didn't even pick up my last pay package, hoping that somehow Dan would get it. The house was rented, and I took a few hundred pounds from our savings and left the rest for her. I didn't even take the car, old as it was, but I packed a small suitcase more sensibly this time and walked out the door. I refused to kiss Dawn goodbye when she tried, not for any specific reason, but simply because I couldn't bear the breakup. She was upset. I was very upset and cried all morning, not sure if this helped. However, I shook Fred's hand and told him to take care of my family. He started crying too, and I could only hold back my tears until I turned the corner at the end of my street. I had yet to tell my parents what had happened, but that was for later, and I was confident that Dawn would give them some suitable story and not prevent them from seeing Marge, whom they obviously loved. They were recruiting Masons for Germany, which was booming at the time, and I went for an interview in North London. My papers were acceptable, and they put me, like everyone else, to the test to prove that I could actually lay bricks. I had only gotten twenty or so down when they stopped me and said they had seen enough and made it clear they would hire me. The other five guys were still busy with their practical walls when I packed my things and left, and I never saw them again in Germany. Germany was hard work, but fun, and I slowly found my way back to life, not forgetting my lost family, but trying to find other things to fill the huge void they left. Most of the women I dated were slutty girls, and I barely had time to look for single women. Then one night, about three or four years later, I met Helga. I paid for her, of course and paid well. Helga was a beautiful 21-year-old girl who was quite high class compared to most of the women. My new friends and I usually dated. Helga fell in love with me, and I never had to pay again. In fact, I never paid for women again. And I mean never, although younger than me. 
Helga taught me how to please a woman while she gave it to me, and we remained a couple, so to speak, for a couple of years. I went to the construction site every morning, and she went to check who she would have love with that day. Well, that suited me. Then Helga, bless her, got married well, and one of her wealthy clients fell in love with her. That happens. Helga couldn't pass up the opportunity to marry such a rich man, even if she really loved him. And I couldn't help but rejoice for her freedom. We parted as friends, and I decided I was finally ready to move back to the UK for good. Not wanting to face the prospect of finding a new minx to suit my fancy. Of course, during this time, I saved a decent amount since my expenses in Germany were very low and the salary was very high. I returned to the UK wondering what to do with the rest of my life. A few years ago when I was in the UK, I arranged to see young Marge. As I suspected, Don and Tom allowed my parents to see her freely, and they were still like a second set of grandparents to her. So I had no shortage of updates on what was going on. The meeting took place at my parents' place, but when I arrived, both Don and Fred were there. This was the first time I had seen them since the day I left the house. Dawn came over as if she was going to kiss me, but I pulled away. I didn't do it on purpose. It was just a normal reaction. However, this upset her, and we did not exchange any more words during my visit. They let me take Marge, then perhaps seven years old, to the park where we last played together. When are you coming home, Dad? She asked me naively. I'm not your daddy anymore, honey, I told her, trying to hold back my tears. Yes, you are my dad, she insisted. Mom and Dad always tell me that you will always be my other dad. Oh God, I couldn't stand it. The rest of the visit passed in a blur, and when I returned her to my parents, Dawn went home upset, unable to meet me again. As I left, I shook Fred's hand and wished them all the best, and told him to take care of Dawn and Marge. His eyes were misty when I left, and I think he realized that I had decided never to see either of them again. It was too difficult to emotionally painful. I decided then and there that I had my own life, and involving myself in their life would not lead to anything good. So when I returned to good old England, I was a free man, and soon found myself a job on a large building contract near Doncaster, where I was given the position of foreman of masons. Then I met someone who changed my life. No, it was not a woman, but a man. And don't make hasty conclusions. Mick was a young, highly qualified civil engineer. A year or so younger than me, and we became best friends. Mick was a man with a burning ambition to get ahead. He came from a working-class background, probably even poorer than mine. But his family supported him through university and beyond, and he was full of energy at our side. I ended up sharing an apartment with him, sharing beer, and even women with him. We truly became best friends at the end of this contract. We were both offered jobs elsewhere with the company. But suddenly, Mick solemnly announced to me what he and I were going to do. We'll start our own business, Tom, he told me confidently. What? I was surprised. Having never discussed this before, my own construction company, he continued. We have all the necessary skills and knowledge, Tom. I only thought about it for five seconds. You're probably right, Mick. I have some money from working in Germany. And with my practical skills and your management knowledge, we could do it. I was rather thinking about your hard work and my good looks, Mick joked in response. We'll see. I replied laughing, and we shook hands on the deal. The first six months we were engaged in small orders, which we successfully completed. I taught me how to lay bricks and other skills that were taught to me, as is usually the case. Mick taught me how to use a level and a theodolite and evaluate contracts, etc., etc., we made a great couple. Then we got our first real contract only for an extension to the house, and we only got it because we promised to do it in 10 weeks instead of the 14 weeks that everyone else promised. We worked every hour possible and finished the job in seven weeks, just the two of us. And before we knew it, we were already working on another project down the street, and then another, and another. Within a couple of years, we hired 20 other people and took on bigger and bigger jobs, both construction and minor engineering work. Mick met June, fell in love with her, and married her. I was his best man and slept with one of the bridesmaids, although this did not lead to anything. My parents died a little earlier than I expected, and with mixed marriage I felt a little lonely. 
I thought about getting married myself. My first marriage was formally dissolved some time ago. I had no contact with Fred and company for many years, and after my parents died, I lost all contact with them. It was better this way. I even almost married and she was a sweet girl, and very attractive, if a little flirty. I don't think she actually cheated on me, but she seemed to enjoy the company of other men too much for my comfort, and after my first experience, I just couldn't handle it. We broke up. As the years passed, our company grew and made more and more money, and I crossed the magical mark of forty years. Still single, although not lacking in female attention, Mick's wife June took it upon herself to find me a wife and presented me with a series of suitable candidates for marriage. I went for it, but treated it as an endless source of available women, like an endless menu. Life was wonderful. Maybe there was something missing, but there really was nothing to cough up. Then Maggie came to our company. Mick hired her, and at first I thought he was crazy for hiring a female engineer. Construction was a man's job, and in our industry, women were limited to office jobs. How could a woman possibly manage a bunch of rough guys on a construction site? How could I be wrong? Maggie was brilliant from day one, politely putting me in my place and charming almost every one of our workers without any problems. I would tell the plumber that we need to finish the job that day, or we have a problem. He usually did. Maggie sweetly asked him if it was possible for him to do it and smiled at him, while the idiot worked through his lunch break so as not to let her down. That's how she was, and she was a real asset. Yes, okay, you guessed it. She was also very beautiful. Short, light brown hair, brown eyes with greenish flecks, slim fit, and what more can I say? She was simply wonderful. Yes, she stole my heart a little. But no, I didn't try to date her. The problem was her age. She was still about 25 or so, while I was a good 17 years older. Both Mick and June urged me to ask her out, but I held back, not wanting to make a fool of myself. Really stupid. Finally, Maggie approached me one day, at one of our sites, to discuss progress. We need these extra blocks by Tuesday. She told me I need four extra steel repairers next week. And when the heck are you going to ask me out on a date? What to say? I invited her to dinner and discovered that our age difference didn't matter, and that no one thought it did. Ten years ago, it might have seemed strange, but we were both consenting adults, so why not? From that first date, I just knew she was special. Maybe, just maybe, this was the girl I was waiting for, and I could leave all my previous doubts behind. Our first love was wonderful for a number of reasons. Maggie was definitely no longer a virgin. And who would have expected that at the time? However, I was trained by a German professional, and the Germans have a reputation for being efficient. I applied the acquired skills to the best of my ability, finding her stunning body a joy to work with. An hour later, we had to go to bed to rest. Oh my God, Tom, she told me, giving herself enough time to catch her breath. I thought I knew what love was, but it looks like I'll have to think again. Sweet words for men's ears. What? We went at it again. Maggie was a quick learner, and I was a willing trainer. Well, when I was training to be a bricklayer, I never thought I'd end up in bed with ginger beer, I joked, using a familiar construction site term for a young civil engineer. Well, maybe you better get used to it, she giggled. Why did you decide to become an engineer, Maggie? It's a strange question under the circumstances, but one I've never asked before. My father was a mason like you, she told me. My whole family seemed to be in construction, so it seemed like a natural fit. Something stirred in my subconscious. What was his name? I asked cautiously, not sure if I should ask Fred. The young lady sitting astride me told me. You don't know him, but his name is Fred Jones. Fred Jones. Maggie Jones. Oh God Almighty Marge, I asked, having difficulty pronouncing the words. Why the heck have I never noticed this connection before, Marge? She was laughing. No one has called me that since I started high school. We had four marriages, and I was the smallest, so they called me Maggie. Then she looked at me in surprise. How the heck do you know this house, Don? I couldn't think of anything else to say. Don. Don. But this is my mom. Maggie was surprised. How do you know my mother, Marge? I asked, having difficulty pronouncing the words. Why the heck have I never noticed this connection before? 
Marge? She was laughing. No one has called me that since I started high school. We had four marriages, and I was the smallest, so they called me Maggie. Then she looked at me in surprise. How the heck do you know this house, Don? I couldn't think of anything else to say. Don? Don. But this is my mom. Maggie was surprised. How do you know my mother? I just lay there and couldn't say anything. And the truth suddenly dawned on her. Oh, God. Oh, Tom. It can't be right, can it? I mean, oh my gosh. I suddenly came to my senses again and tried my best to tear her away from me so I could run away. What have I done? How could I live with myself? I haven't seen this woman, this girl, since I was seven. Haven't heard from her for fifteen years or more. But she was still my daughter. Well, she was, wasn't she? And I just made love to her. Oh my God, what are you doing? Maggie demanded, as I tried to get out from under her. What do you think I'm doing, Maggie? I answered. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I had no idea. Sorry about what? Was this a serious question? Well, you're my darn daughter, Maggie, I screamed. We shouldn't be. No, I do not, Maggie interrupted him. I'm not your real daughter. We are not related by blood in any way. Well, maybe that's true, but even so, my objection seems to have fizzled out. So what's wrong with what we're doing then? She challenged me. I did not know. It just didn't seem right. But, well, why not? What are we going to do, Maggie? Quite pathetic under the circumstances. Well, I know what I want to do, she replied. That's what we did. In fact, we did this several more times over the next few hours. I never really realized that I fell in love with Don. We've known each other for so long that it kind of grew. Greta. Well, I loved her very much, but I never really fell in love. And I think the same can be said about Anna. Otherwise, I would have married her. But Maggie, I could only think of her as Maggie and never Marge again. I just fell head over heels in love, and she's with me. I don't even remember asking her to marry me. Maybe she asked me. I have no ideas. And we just assumed that would be the case. That's what we did. The first meeting with Don and Fred was a little rocky, as you can probably imagine. Fred accepted this rather quickly, perhaps feeling like he was getting his old best friend back. The Don took a little longer, and things between us were a little cold for a while. But one day, she softened, accepted it, and welcomed me as her son-in-law. What a laugh. As Maggie and I walked back down the aisle, hand in hand, a married couple, she turned to me and reminded me of something I said years ago when I was a child. You promised me that someday in the future, you would come back and play a big role in my life. Tom, she whispered to me. Do you remember this? I asked in surprise. I never forgot it. She told me. We both smiled at each other, knowing that we would be happy together. Tom and his wife Dawn were a happy couple and had a daughter Marge. Their close friend Fred often came to visit them. One day, Dawn began flirting with Fred in front of Tom, testing the boundaries of jealousy and openness in their relationship. This brought intrigue into their lives. The flirting and innuendo games continued for some time, 